Unleash the power of the mind, it says. But what if we just don't? Today on RPG Challenge Runs, we ask ourselves, can you beat Scarlet Nexus without psychokinesis? That's right, all of the object slinging, dumpster truck smashing, and uh, bus driving is going out of the window because it's melee only all the way. As always, we're playing on a fresh save file on the hardest difficulty setting, and we're putting a strict ban on all forms of free and paid DLC, including demo bonuses and collaboration packs. We're playing solo, so no party members, and obviously no glitches, hacks, or mods. Let's rock! When choosing a protagonist, we go with Kasane. She's less tanky and relies most heavily on the use of psychokinesis, so selecting her will make the run as difficult as possible. While we whiz through these early portions of the game, let's take a second to remind ourselves what psychokinesis even does. Characters in Scarlet Nexus all have unique superpowered abilities, with the protagonist being able to pick up and throw large objects at enemies. This allows you to safely attack from a distance and also break enemy shields and other defences. In fact, some enemies will regularly go out of melee range and seemingly require the use of psychokinesis in order to defeat them. If you've played the game Control, you know what we're talking about. Anyway, we step into the shoes of OSF soldier Kasane, protecting Earth from weird creatures called Others. <laughs> and gee, it seems like they're running out of ideas for monster names these days. <laughs> As always, we will not be discussing any story spoilers in case anyone watching hasn't actually played the game before, but we will be showing characters, bosses and locations. If you hadn't already realised from the footage here, enemies on very hard difficulty are much more tanky than their counterparts on the regular difficulty, and they hit a lot harder. The game won't allow us to remove this currently unknown ally from combat against this Wither Sabbat, but for the rest of the game we will be playing solo, meaning all party members must be removed and cannot participate in any combat. Now that we're level 2, we spend our first point on the brain map, but contrary to what most people might pick, we avoid the damage and defense boosts and instead grab the double jump skill. This will give us more options in combat and allow us to enter otherwise inaccessible areas on some maps. We take a minute to get introduced to our incredibly nice and kind platoon members. She then Ritter. My power is electrokinesis. I don't plan on being your friend. Um, yeah, he can he can sod off out the party. <laughs> and we arrive at the Mizuhagawa district. This place is basically one big construction yard, but it's really fun to explore. After beating up a few scummy pendus, who are basically just cannon fodder, we gain access to SAS, allowing us to temporarily borrow powers from our allies, which in Sheedon's case is electrokinesis, making all of our attacks deal additional electric damage with the potential to eventually paralyse them for a few seconds. Bruh, you said this was a solo run, yet you used Sheeton's power, dislike, unsubscribe. Oh god, he's back. Yes, we are using another character's power. The character themselves is not involved in any combat. If I take eggs from your house and throw them at someone else's door, does that mean that you were involved in the egging? No. So we are allowing the use of borrowed non-psychokinesis powers through SAS. It is, after all, a core gameplay mechanic and mandatory to complete the story anyway. But we are soon hit with another dilemma. Special object attacks. These involve holding the left trigger to attack with special objects via QTEs. It doesn't say that these use psychokinesis, but they do drain the purple PK bar, so it's kind of a grey area. How about this, we don't allow any special object actions unless mandatory to progress the story, like lowering a bridge or something. I think that's fair and I hope you agree. We soon arrive at our first boss fight against this Dispen Perry. <laughs> By the way, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing any of these other names correctly, but feel free to correct me in the comments section. <laughs> He's a beefy boy with a huge health pool, powerful melee attacks, and a nasty water cannon strapped to his back, which can inflict soak, preventing us from dodging. After only 30 seconds in the ring, we're slapped out of there. This guy's way too strong for us right now, so there's only one thing for it. 
All together now, we need to grind some more. The problem is that there are no enemies left in the entire construction site, but if we leave the area and come back, some of the enemies will respawn. Sadly, they're only awarding about 10 XP each, but it's better than nothing. Here's our setup going into this boss fight a second time. We're level 7 and have grabbed a few more nodes on the brain map, mainly evasive skills that grant us more options in combat. We've also grabbed an extra plug-in slot for an additional accessory, in this case power enhance for damage and force field for defence. Let's go. We have a bumpy start but gradually begin to learn his moveset and, more importantly, how often he attacks. I just realised I've been saying he and him, like, <laughs> what on earth implies that this thing is even male? <laughs> okay, it. It eventually drops below the 50% HP mark, resulting in its water cannon being upgraded to fire triple shots. This is now super difficult to dodge and relies mostly on RNG. When he does his big leaps, we're supposed to pull a truck down on top of him for massive damage. But of course, that's not an option for us. We push the offensive when he gets paralysed, but we're at low HP and completely out of healing items, so inevitably... So annoying. Yeah, I agree. Oh, we were so close. Attempt number three? Nah, nope. Same thing. Damn that water cannon! Thankfully, on attempt number four, we remembered to stock up on extra healing items and played the fight much slower and safer, not taking any risks. It pays off and the thing falls after 15 minutes. Job done. That's 400 XP in the bag. We accept and turn in our first side quest, but these things give pitiful rewards, so we won't be going out of our way to do many of them. We remove Kyoka from the party and head to Kikuchiba, which for some reason has a ball of skyscrapers just floating mid-air. <laughs> Kyoka's duplication ability is currently pretty useless as I believe it only duplicates objects that are picked up with psychokinesis, so fighting off these vase paws is incredibly grindy. And for anyone wondering, yes we will be using Brain Crush, which is a finisher cutscene skill triggered after depleting an enemy's yellow crush bar. This is a mandatory action against more story bosses and doesn't use any PK bar, so it's fair game by the rules. Kagero is introduced and needs to be removed for this Brawn Yawn mini boss. Borrowing his power allows us to go temporarily invisible, which as you'll see a bit later is completely overpowered. It even allows us to charge up an incredibly powerful melee strike for a sneaky stealth hit. The enemy is not particularly strong and it telegraphs its attacks way in advance, so it's over in just a few minutes. With that, we gain access to the Hideout, which is a safe location that we will be returning to at the end of each phase, or chapter, of the game. Here we can hang out with allies by giving them gifts and doing Bond episodes, which are mostly just skippable cutscenes. This all helps raise their Bond rank, upgrading the effectiveness of their SAS powers and various other things. If you've played any of the modern Persona games, this is functionally identical to Social Links or Confidants. Honestly though, all of this hideout stuff is a really nice change of pace in an otherwise action heavy game. There's a section here in which we have to team up with rival platoon leader Yuito, you know, the other playable protagonist, to take down a horde of vase paws, but obviously we don't use his SAS ability because his ability is also psychokinesis and is therefore banned. And what was the point of this mission? To find a fountain pen. Yep, we risked our lives battling to the death for the sake of a freaking pen. <laughs> ah, Jesus Christ. Time for phase two, Broken Scattered Days. We start by getting dumped almost half a kilometre from our objective, but after a long walk, we're introduced to Hanabi and Sugumi, both members of Yuito's platoon who are temporarily going to join us for this training exercise. As always, we instantly remove them from the party. Hanabi's fire works very similar to Shiden's electricity from earlier, allowing us to ignite these fuel pool enemies with ease. Whereas Sugumi's clairvoyance isn't very helpful yet, it allows us to see invisible enemies and also dodge easier, so that's going to be more of a late game thing. 
boss fight time, a 1v1 against level 13 Yuito. Not only can he use his psychokinesis against us, but his powerful melee combos deal massive damage. Oh, that was close. The fight drags on, but Yuito gets bored, so hits us in the face with a girder. Thankfully, it's not game over, though, because the game takes pity on us and allows the story to progress. We just have to embarrassingly sit through a cutscene where everyone is praising Yuito and telling him how amazing he is. Rawr! We've got our next deployment orders from Haruka, and it's straight over to the abandoned subway. Here we're introduced to the next gameplay mechanic, Brain Drive. Basically, it fills over time during combat, and when it gets full, we get buffs for a while. It's an automatic passive thing that just kind of happens, so it's easy to just forget about it. With Gemma and Sheedon removed from the party, we push on through the subway. Enemies here are mostly very weak, and any time we feel even remotely threatened, we can use Gemma's SES power for temporary invincibility. Again, that will become super helpful later in the game. We finally grab the Auto Heal ability, meaning our HP will now gradually restore outside of combat. That is an absolute game changer and means we no longer have to burn through healing items between fights. These rat ruts are the next problem. Their outer shell is a sheet of heavy armour that you're supposed to break using psychokinesis, but without that we just have to keep hitting them with weak melee attacks until they eventually break. Meanwhile, they're shooting all of this orange crap at us and we're soon dead. The second attempt goes a bit better though, we just try to give them more space, stay mobile and try not to get flanked. They're down in just a couple of minutes. After more incredibly long walks, probably designed to pad out the runtime, we grab our third and final plug-in slot, this time for a health boost. I'll be honest, I wasn't quite sure what the optimal plug-in setup would be, so for the entire run we just keep one power, one force field and one health plug-in, at the highest tiers possible, obviously. I don't know, hmm, what are your favourite plugins in this game? Feel free to leave a comment down there, because I'm curious to hear if we could have made things easier on ourselves, or if this really is the best setup. Next up is a boss fight against Kadama, a minor side character that the game never really tells us much about and basically has no impact on the plot. Sheedon and Gemma are added back into the party for this fight, but luckily we can remove them before they deal or receive any damage. Kadama is relatively fast and agile, and fires these sound wave thingies at us, normally in bursts of three. As with most bosses in this game, she has an incredibly huge health pool, especially on very hard difficulty, where it feels like our attacks are doing nothing. The strategy is to mostly keep our distance, wait for the SAS skills to refill, then activate both Gemma's invincibility and Sheedon's electricity to rush in for a burst of damage. This seems to be working well, and five minutes into the fight, we've dropped her guard and get our first brain crush in. Now that she's in brain dry form, her attacks are all upgraded. We try to keep her stun locked and paralysed as much as possible, as well as trying to get her temporarily stuck on various pieces of scenery. It's all going really well until we get hit by one of those slow floating blob things, which inflicts confusion and therefore mixes up our controls so Kasane starts walking in semi-random directions. Unable to avoid anything, we get knocked down before we have a chance to heal. Oh, we were so close. The second attempt, as always, goes much better now that we understand her moveset. We do get hit with a confusion a couple of times, but thankfully we're able to heal through it. Yes, we could have used a normalisation tablet to cure the status ailment, but honestly, it takes so long to cycle through the items list. It's actually quicker to just let the confusion drop off naturally. She's super low, so we use the last of our SAS juice to push the offensive. This was a bit greedy, but luckily it paid off. You're pretty good. Aw, thanks. <laughs> After more gift giving and bond episodes, we push on to phase three. Fated to move upon awakening. Anyone else think that sounds very badly translated? <laughs> I think later on there's a chapter called Feeling Unraveled Time Together, which is like, what, what does that even mean? <laughs> Anyway, we're in the 1v1 against Sheedon and have no SAS powers available to us right now, so we're relying exclusively on melee attacks and dodges. Getting a perfect dodge and doing the follow-up attack does grant us iframes, but after 5 minutes we're out of healing items and Sheedon gets the win. 
but thankfully he's not so lucky on the second attempt. Man, it felt so good to beat this guy up. <laughs> he's so annoying. We're now joined by Luca and Arashi and head into the Kunad Highway. Arashi's hyper velocity slows down time, including all enemies, and is incredibly overpowered, but it only lasts for a short amount of time. Meanwhile, Luca's teleportation does exactly what it says on the tin. It can teleport us to an enemy in combat or a few meters forward when outside of combat. So we can pass through certain metal fences and things, but more on that later. We're now up against OSF Septentry on Karen Travers, this game's main antagonist. He's a whopping level 50, while we're only level 24, and that's after excessive grinding. He's super fast, can dodge almost anything, and has a wide range of skills. But wait, isn't this fight the one that you're forced to lose for story reasons? Let's try, uh... Oh, oh well, that didn't work. <laughs> on the second attempt, we drag out the fight long enough for him to use his brain field. More on those in a minute. And now dying allows us to progress the story. It's all very confusing. Anyway, we easily take out the Suo NDF enemies, remove forced party member Yuito, and go up against this winnery chinnery mini boss. This thing is slow and very predictable, so once we've reminded ourselves of its moveset, we stick to its sides and keep slicing away. It's a long fight, but an easy one. The good news is that we now have access to three SAS abilities, but the bad news is that we've travelled to the future of Suo and there is no way of backtracking. Yep, we are stuck here until we beat the next boss. For anyone who's seen our challenge run of Tales of Arise without art, it's basically a repeat of that horrific sewer section, which I won't spoil, but you should check out that video after this one because it was really good fun. I think that was the first video I made that I was actually proud of. Yeah, good times. Anyway, the boss here is this samurai guy named question mark, question mark, question mark, whose identity I won't spoil in case anyone watching does want to go and play this game at some point. Within seconds, we get absolutely obliterated. <laughs> oh, it wasn't even close. I would say we need to grind some more, but there's nothing left here. Absolutely no enemies, and remember, we cannot backtrack. Second attempt, and he's winning almost every close quarters confrontation. Arashi's hyper velocity does help take the edge off it, but it feels like we're constantly critical. Psychokinesis would make this fight an absolute breeze because this samurai guy clearly specialises in close quarters combat. Ah, dead again. We upgrade our weapons, stock up on items and survey our surroundings. Yep, we're definitely stuck here. For anyone wondering, yes you can save and reload your game to respawn a few super weak enemies here, but they give tiny amounts of XP so it's basically a soft lock until you can beat this guy. On this third attempt, we try to be more mindful of our positioning, but we also get lucky because it seems like he's not being as aggressive as he normally is. We don't need to take him all the way down though, because after just a couple of minutes, the trigger pops for his cutscene to play out and we can move on. Oh, thank god for that. We keep giving gifts to our allies, you have a good eye. and we hit bond level 3 with Kyoka. This unlocks her combo vision, which we are banning for this run. Why? Well, because combo visions involve party members themselves coming in and attacking for you, rather than just you borrowing their powers. This will eventually cut off a huge chunk of abilities, but given that this is a solo run, it does seem like the right call. It's the reason I always ban follow-up attacks in Persona challenge runs, it's just not in the spirit of a solo experience in my opinion. Anyway, we get asked by this, um, individual to gather some secret codes. And where might we find these codes? Well, we're told to go and watch the Scarlet Nexus TV series. <laughs> like, yeah, don't forget to check the website to find out where and when to watch the TV show. <laughs> oh god, it's so, so shamelessly breaking the fourth wall here. <laughs> Time for Phase 5, the point of no return. Enemies are much tougher now, in fact we actually died one time against this first mob of kitchen rummies and rat ruts. Yeah, we're going to have to be much less reckless from this point on. Next up is a mandatory battle against Yuito, and I actually made a big mistake here. You see, you're forced to enter your brain field at one point, and during this section I just kept spamming the melee attacks, avoiding both psychokinesis options, 
but after the battle, the game shows this information. Brain Field allows psychokinesis attacks without restrictions. Then it lists the sweet melee attack underneath. I don't know guys, it feels like using any attacks within a brain field is using psychokinesis, especially since the animation playing out looks like the object she's swinging around is being lifted by her mind and not her body. This is another very grey area, so we're reloading our previous save file, and this time we may not take any actions within the mandatory brain field. We just let the timer expire, and from this point on, all use of the brain field is banned. To be honest, the brain field is kind of overpowered anyway, especially since you can use skill points to make yourself literally invincible for the entire duration of every use of it so this ban will add much more challenge to the run. With that pedantry dealt with, we buy and distribute loads of gifts, do a few more quests to complete more of the challenge log for some bonus XP and items, and push on to phase 6 to get back what's important. But why does it keep spawning us miles away from where we need to be? Ugh! After skipping through a few cutscenes, we arrive here at the next map, the Supernatural Life Research Facility Museum Ruins. <laughs> wow, that's a mouthful. Not much to report here, we just have to use Sheen's electricity to open some doors and grab some keycards. Enemy mobs are pretty easy, so I'll save your time. We push down into the creepy underground lab and face the next boss, Rotunda Pagoda. This is an unusual boss fight. Basically, the thing is invincible until you defeat all of these little filler pillar wasps that it scatters around everywhere. Thankfully, they're pretty weak, so it's easy to take them all out. Then the boss opens its metal grate and becomes vulnerable, either until you walk into one of its targeting circles to get bombed, or until a short timer expires. By the time the metal grate crashes back down, we've taken off like, what, 8% of its health? Ah, oh, this is going to take a while. After a while, sections of the floor begin to repeatedly electrify, but we stick to the diagonals so that when we get knocked back, we land perfectly in between two of the semicircles. We go for all-out DPS, come on, come on! Oh, we have to do another wave. And another wave. Then we almost get hit by a targeting circle, but hyper-velocity ourselves out of there. A few strikes later, and we are done! Oh, and we hit level 32 as well. Nice! After a quick visit to the BFG's house, it's time for the third battle against Yuito. But this time, he's got Luka and Sugumi backing him up. This is an incredibly challenging 1v3, easily the toughest fight of the game so far. It's difficult to choose who to target first, but we decide to go for Sugumi, since her clairvoyance nullifies the effect of our invisibility. She's paralysed and we get cocky, pushing the offensive a bit too hard. So she gets up, unloads a full magazine into us, before Luca whacks us and Yuito flanks us to finish the job. Ouch! On the second attempt, we get a bit further. After taking out Tsugumi, we're able to quickly finish off Luca because he's kinda predictable and doesn't fully utilise his teleportation. Yuito has the same skills as before, his usual psychokinesis and some strong melee attacks. He even enters Brainfield now, but we make sure to play super defensively while inside there, draining all of our SAS abilities. We hit him for a brain crush and he's super low. Our health is looking good, but that's when this happens. He picks up a box and launches it at our head. Now that's what I call massive damage. A similar thing happens in the third attempt. We're doing so well until he again hits us with the cube of death fourth attempt, and while this fight plays out, I want to respond to a few questions that many of you guys keep asking. But before I do, another quick thanks to these fantastic Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members for keeping this hobby of mine going. If you also fancy throwing a bit of spare change my way, you get access to full, unedited boss fight footage, access to my Persona 5 Royal Min Max guide which has now been updated, plus some other discussion posts and polls on there, or you can just join the Discord server for free and chat with some other RPG enthusiasts. Cheers guys, I really appreciate the support. Now the first thing that people keep asking me is why do challenge runs at all? What's the point? 
In fact, I get loads of comments every week by people just saying that it ruins the game, or it's a waste of time, or that you'd have to have brain damage to do a challenge run. <laughs> Well, I want to make a full discussion video about challenge running sometime in the future, but I'd say there are two main reasons. Firstly, challenge running allows you to experience parts of a game that you otherwise would have missed. Sometimes as players, we skim through the easy parts of games and never give it too much thought, but challenge running forces you to slow down, learn enemy patterns and behaviours, and research and implement inventive strategies to overcome these obstacles. Secondly, I'd say it's a great way to experience a beloved game in a brand new way. Let's use one of the Persona runs as an example. Sure, you might have beaten the game dozens of times and know every single story, beat an item location, but have you ever actually used a mandrake? Or a bicorn? Or a slime? Probably not, because they're low level and they're weak. It's the same reason that people love Nuzlocke runs of Pokemon, or doing something like Magikarp only. Challenge running is fun to do, it's fun to watch, and maybe one day it'll become almost as big as speed running. For anyone who's sceptical, take an old game that you really love but you've beaten dozens of times before, and give yourself a restriction and really stick to it. You'll be surprised how much fun you'll have. Yuito's almost dead here, but if you've got another question you'd like me to answer in a future video, please drop it down in the comments because I'd love to do more of these mini discussions. In exchange, I need some recommendations for shorter RPGs that we can do on the channel. It's difficult to pump out a 100 hour game every month, but if you know of any good RPGs that are like 20-30 hours long, please let me know. Scarlet Nexus is a great example of what I'm looking for. Anyway, you know the drill by now. Give out the gifts, upgrade our weapon, and push on to the next chapter. Phase, whatever it's called. <laughs> This one is pretty short. After a couple of weak mobs, we're in a rematch with Kadama. She's level 35 now, but has mostly the exact same moveset. The only difference is that she can now transform into a copy of Kasane, and is invulnerable during the transformation animation. After 11 minutes, she's dead, and we push onto the fourth and final fight against Yuito and his platoon. We instantly remove both party members that get added in, and have a look at what we're up against. Yuito is joined by fire user Hanabi, as well as the invincibility guy Gamma, and they're all a whopping level 36. Yes, we are level 39, but it's a 1v3, and honestly, levels don't matter much in this game. Just like last time, it's a tough decision, but we go for Hanabi first, since she has the ability to burn us, which could get nasty, and I'm guessing she's the squishiest target. During her brain drive, she can launch fireballs at us from long range, which hurt like hell, but our tactic is to use the secondary attack button while Sheedon's SAS is active to create these spinning Beyblades of electrical death. This has the ability to deal huge amounts of damage, but as a drawback, it locks Kasane in place with no option to cancel the animation. Four minutes in, Hanabi is down, and we hit level 40. Since Gemma was already at half HP from all the electrical spinning, he's also down just a few minutes later. Time for the main course, Yuito himself. This is an incredibly tough fight, made worse by the fact that we're stuck in such a small room with only two SAS abilities at our disposal. We survive his brain field, but we're out of healing items, therefore in a battle of attrition we would definitely lose, so we have to push the offensive. Sadly, he doesn't get stun locked and we get wiped out during the Beyblade animation. The second attempt, meanwhile, goes terribly. We don't even manage to take out Hanabi before getting wiped. Ouch. We're back at level 35 for our third attempt. Again, apologies to the speed of the footage, but I don't want this video to be hours long. Patreon supporters, as always, it'll all be uploaded there at regular speed for your viewing pleasure. Again, it takes 4 minutes to wipe out Hanabi, and we get some nice perfect dodges against Gemma. It's only another couple of minutes before he's also wiped out. Again, time for Yuito. As always, he's not too difficult at first, but once he gets to about half HP, he does his brain field thing and then enters brain drive, and it's at this point that he has the potential to easily wipe us out at any time. We have to stay mobile and watch for an opening. Every time we go in for a few hits, it feels like a huge gamble, but I found one interesting strategy. He seems to have a tough time navigating obstacles, especially this bunch of barrels right here, so we lure him over and sure enough, he gets completely stuck behind there. 
The thing is, I kind of feel bad for the guy, and I don't want to exploit a glitch to win the fight. We'll just hit him a few times to try to dislodge him, and if it turns out that he's fully stuck, then we'll restart the fight. Okay, right, he's out. Nice. <laughs> he soon falls, so we keep electrifying him until the cutscene triggers. It turns out we didn't even need to fully kill him. <laughs> nice. Phase 8. They speak of the hidden past. This is quite a relaxing chapter in which we push through the Hino Mountain to get to the religious city of Togetsu. The only annoying enemies here are these Session Pounds, which home in on you before self-destructing. You're supposed to take them out at range with either Psychokinesis or a combo vision like Yorkers, but here our only option is to take a risky last second dodge. They do deal friendly fire damage to other enemies though, which is nice. The boss of this area is Coil Moyle, who is perhaps the most boring boss in the entire game. Basically, you keep hitting the thing until its icy armour falls off, then deal as much damage as you can before it goes underground for another set of icy armour. Rinse and repeat. Oh, and no, we're not allowing the use of Assault Visions, which are these things where you press two buttons at once to call in another party member for a special attack, for the exact same reason we didn't allow Combo Visions. It's a solo run, so we can't have any other party members jumping in for us. Needless to say, the fight takes a stupidly long time, but eventually the thing goes down to a brain crush. After going invisible and watching our OSF colleague try to 1v1A wall, we break through some super tanky ice walls and go up against Kyoka. I actually forgot about this fight, so we were a bit underprepared, but we're still kind of over leveled from the recent Yuito fight, so having a 1v1 like this isn't really much of a challenge. Later in the fight she introduces clones of herself, which are kinda weak, but there's no point killing them because she just spawns in more of them. Instead we use stealth to our advantage and exclusively target Kyoka herself. She's quickly down, and after having a pleasant chat to Yuito's team to bury the hatchet, we're on to phase 9, protecting lives and protected lives. Another chapter, another Kadama fight. This time though, she's joined by twin Yuta. Thankfully, both of them have exactly the same moveset, so the fight is pretty straightforward so long as you keep both of them in view. Kadama quickly falls and Yuta is close behind. This was a surprisingly easy fight. I actually expected that one to be a lot harder. <laughs> the next map is Arahabaki, or Arahabaki as they say it in this game. We're stopped by a huge bridge that needs lowering, but remember what I said earlier. We don't allow any special object actions unless mandatory to progress the story, like lowering a bridge or something. Yeah, this special object action doesn't use up any of the PK bar and is mandatory to progress, so I think it's fair to allow it. No doubt all of the 5000 IQ haters will flock to the comments section about this one though. <laughs> Like that one guy in the FF15 magic only video, whose big gotcha moment was that Noctis used a weapon in a cutscene. A cutscene! <laughs> I swear these people are sharing a brain cell. <laughs> After a bit of cardio and button mashing, we arrive at the next boss, Dispen Fisher. This guy is very similar to the Dispen Perry boss we fought right at the start of the game, but it has the ability to go on the ceiling and obviously we can't knock it down with Psychokinesis, so the Fisher remains very much in the driving seat here. Thankfully its attacks are slow and weak, including this one where it launches a barrage of orange shark thingies that remind me of those enemies from Ratchet and Clank. <laughs> and those guys were annoying. Meanwhile, with the help of Kyoka's duplicate and Sheedon's electricity, the Dispen Fisher is out of there. Job done. After a touching moment with Yuito, the two platoons finally join together. Yeah, let's go! This means we now have access to nine different SAS skills. Well, eight really, because we can't use Yuito's psychokinesis skill, but it's kind of meh anyway. More gifts, more bond episodes, blah blah blah, phase 10. Conclusion and an accidental meeting. We head through the Hano Mountains to Togetsu and sneak into Babe. <laughs> no, not that one. These initial cut ruts, just like the rat ruts from earlier, are heavily armoured and deal insane amounts of damage, meaning we get wiped within seconds. Thankfully, the second attempt goes much smoother and we can crack on. I love this map because you can run through most areas while avoiding enemies and almost never being forced to fight. 
This means that by ignoring optional side areas, we can breeze through the entire location in a matter of minutes. We save the game and head on up to face the boss, but this one is a bit different. This time, we're not dealing damage. We just have to escape by continuing to run to the right side of the screen while the ground falls down beneath us. I remember the first time I played this game, I just kept dying at this part and I had no idea why. It just always felt like I was never fast enough. Not here though. Utilising Arashi's hyper velocity feels like almost cheating and we easily breeze through the entire section. We then head to the Kunad Highway for some red strings business which I won't spoil for story reasons and we're done. We keep exchanging items to get the new versions of the enhancers which I believe are the best plugins available to us right now but again I'd like to hear your thoughts. After that we rest up and push on to phase 11, feeling unravel time together. Enemies here are pretty easy, but using Kagero's invisibility makes this section a breeze with zero combat required. Again, unravelling these red strings is a mandatory story action, so put your pitchforks down. We then listen to the insightful words of our party members. What kind of knew from the start that she was causing an entanglement? Oh, right. She held back her feelings so she could part with you with no regrets. I see. I'm sorry. Yeah? <sighs> Wait, uh? <sighs> Is that all you've got to say? Uh? <sighs> <laughs> Time for the final phase of the game, Path to the Future and Freedom. We head down into the Sumeragi tomb and to a distorted map which is kind of like bits of all the previous maps mushed together. It's pretty cool. Enemies offer a mild challenge but it's nothing we can't handle so we push on into the Dominus Circus boss fight. This guy is super tough and has a lot of phases. It's kind of like the game's way of testing to see if you're ready for the final boss. Attempt number one and we're dead in under a minute. <laughs> Attempt number two and we're dead in two minutes and 11 seconds. So, you know, it's an improvement. <laughs> Attempt number three and this is where we start taking this guy seriously. In its first phase, it can block attacks with its parasol umbrella shield thingy, so we just have to keep flanking the thing and praying for paralysis. This boss is kind of slow, so we just keep using the electrified Beyblade strategy and it seems to pay off. Less than three minutes in and we brain crush the thing before moving on to its second phase. It's turned into an elephant thing now, but it has no shield, so we go on the offensive. One move it loves to spam is this dense fog forcing us to use Sugumi's clairvoyance to see where it's gone. Before long, this weaker form is down and we push on to phase three. It's now turned into this ball with a drill arm thing, <laughs> but when we push the offensive, we seem to keep it stun locked. Maybe it's weak to electricity or something? I have no idea, but this was definitely the easiest phase so far. And now it's final form. In this fourth phase, it has access to basically all of its previous skills. Plus, it's got its shield back, meaning a frontal assault is a no-go. We play it slow and safe, especially when it raises its umbrella ready for the huge AoE water blast attack. Other than that, yeah, it was just a really fun fight. After eight minutes, we go for the brain crush, watch this super flashy animation play out, and we're ready for the final boss of the game. Before we go in though, we have a few bits to take care of. Firstly, beating the Dispen Perry rematch in the missions grants us other ecology simulation A's, whatever the hell they are, which we can trade in for a weapon use record, which we can then exchange for a Butterfly Psy, the best non-DLC weapon for Kasane. We then excessively bribe all of our teammates until they're at max bond rank. Some of the bonuses here are completely useless, but others like Gemma's chance to nullify incoming damage could be absolutely game changing. Now it's finally time to face the final boss. Here's our setup going in. We're at level 61 and still on very hard difficulty. We're carrying the maximum number of all useful items, have the best weapon in the game and have the three new plugins boosting damage, defense and health as discussed earlier. We've also purchased every useful node on the brain map. The only blanks here are stuff related to psychokinesis, brain field or assault visions, none of which we need so there's no reason to unlock them. Finally, just a quick scroll here to prove that we have not claimed any of the DLCs. Let's go. 
As we saw briefly in the early game, Karen Travers really isn't messing around. He may look slow, but regularly teleports around and has access to every character's powers. That includes Sheen's electrokinesis, Sugumi's clairvoyance, Gemma's invincibility, etc. To make matters worse, just like Kadama earlier, he gets a crazy amount of iframes every time he teleports, meaning he dodges almost everything like he's doing his best impression of Albert Wesker. <laughs> We just play it slow and safe. Soon enough, he activates his brain field. I am under no delusion that Karen could likely one-shot us during this section, so we just need to keep cycling through SAS skills until the timer at the top expires. He does catch us off guard with a cheeky teleport flank, but thankfully Gemma's bond ability triggers and it gets blocked. And with that, the brain field portion is over. Whew. We continue spamming the electrified Beyblade attack due to its wide radius, making it more likely to connect with Karen. He soon gets paralysed, giving us an opportunity to deal MASSIVE DAMAGE! Well, massive compared to what we were doing before. <laughs> Gemma's invincibility SAS is perfect for when Karen does the cloning move, but other than that we just wait for openings. One great opportunity is immediately after he uses his electricity skill, as he has quite a long recovery time after doing that one. Before long, he's throwing waves of fiery death cubes at us, and invisibility seems to be useless, but we save Gemma's invincibility for the final barrage and watch the mid-fight cutscene. The pace really picks up here, but we can't afford to get sloppy. With one final invisible strike, we brain crush the guy and push on to phase 2. Things get a bit complicated here. You're supposed to complete this phase by damaging the spinner that spawns in the middle of the arena and using a special object action to damage the statue and then use another special object action on the statue's head to make Karen vulnerable. Otherwise, Karen cannot be damaged in any way. Even his pesky shadow form constantly sits at 100% health no matter what you do. I spent a long time trying to find a way around this intended method, but it's obvious that using special object actions is mandatory to progress the fight. We complete the mandatory special object actions, but we're still dealing pitiful damage to Karen. FYI, if the use of Brain Field were allowed, this fight could be done super easily and without needing to use any special object actions, but here we are. <laughs> Second wave, destroy the cluster crystal, hit the statue, make Karen vulnerable, deal some damage and repeat until we can hit him with another brain crush. Time for phase 3, and we are alone with no SAS options at all. We just keep evading and dealing chip damage until more and more allies get gradually introduced. This third phase is a pretty awesome fight that really shows off all of the characters and makes you appreciate the journey that you've been through with all of them. Karen doesn't have a lot of health, but he's much more evasive now, so you just have to be clever and be prepared to go on the offensive anytime there's even a small opening. After just 5 minutes, we combine Arashi's hyper velocity with Sheen's electrokinesis and spam the spin to win button until Karen is dead and we have completed the game. Can you beat Scarlet Nexus without psychokinesis? Hell yeah! Well, there were three places where we were forced to use mandatory special object actions, but I suppose it depends on how strict you want to be. I'll let you guys decide, but I loved this run. Scarlet Nexus is such a great game, definitely an underrated gem, so please go and play it if you haven't already. Well, that's all from our OSF friends for today. Feel free to check out our other challenge runs if you haven't already. They're all in one playlist. GG guys, see you later. Cheers. We're now up against OSF Septentrion Now that's what I call massive damage. <coughs> I really shouldn't do that. <coughs> that voice. Senpai, you should like and subscribe.